Hello, and welcome to the Laserlord YouTube channel. In this video, I will be showing you the process involved in making these faux enamel pin badges. These are 3D printed, painted, and cast. In order to do the line art, you should start with a simple design. Usually, you can make a rough sketch to get the overall form, and as any artist will tell you, references are very important. After you get the rough form good, you can refine the sketch, and if you're going to be basing the 3D model entirely off of this drawing, pen pressure, if you have a pen tablet, can make the resultant pin badge look much more natural. But whenever you are making the artwork, remember the minimum feature size that your 3D printer can produce. For most resin printers, uh, that's going to be about 0.8 millimeters. You don't want your lines to be too thin. Smaller features will probably appear in the 3D print, but they will be slightly expanded and it might not look right. You need to remember that the lines that you're drawing will be enclosing different color regions, just like a real pin badge would. The lines will be painted gold, or whatever color you want, and if possible, save this as an SVG for the next step. In order to make the 3D model, I use Fusion 360 because as of June 2021, it is still free to hobbyists, but other CAD tools might act similarly. If you have an image, you can use the tutorial that I made up here that shows you how to convert an image to a 3D model using Inkscape and SVGs, and that SVG is another reason why, if you could have saved it as an SVG, why that would have saved you a little bit of tracing to do. However, I didn't have that, and I found that it is much better to trace by hand than to use a generated model. I like to use the spline tool for this. It's a good way to make everything curvy, natural, and sort of round everything out, because 3D print will round everything out anyway, so you might as well see what it'll look like. If tracing lines, you can leave them as just simple zero width lines because in order to give the walls thickness, we will use an offset. I also tested the possibility of using the extrude surface feature and then thickening it later. That does kind of work. However, whenever the designs get complicated, Fusion 360 tends to complain. Whenever you're using the offset tool, the trim and extension tool in order to make your sketches clean and make them bound regions in order to be extruded and also for indicating the different regions of color, the trim and extension tools are good just to keep your sketch clean. For my models, I extruded the base solid part two millimeters and I extruded the design, I think, three to five millimeters. The thicker you make it, the less it'll look like a pin badge, but the more durable it'll be and the more opaque the casting will be if you used a vaguely transparent resin like I did. And in order for it to be printable on the resin printer, at least easy to work with, um, make sure to add a chamfer to the bottom of the model so that it can be easily pried off of the build plate. So onto the 3D printing. Resin printing, I believe, is the best option, but a well-tuned FDM printer with a small nozzle should also be able to do well. I used to have good luck with a 0.2 millimeter nozzle. I could even print D&D minifigs with it. So if you can get your FDM printer tuned to this point, there's no reason why you can't do this. And if you trust your bed adhesion as much as I do, you would probably be able to print the model upside down, which would give you the benefit of a very smooth surface on the front of your design, which will make the paint look a lot better but I used resin printing. This is just a standard resin 3D printing process where my method uses a two bin wash method and I find that this wastes the least amount of isopropyl alcohol. Um, I use high purity 99% because if you get anything less than that, you're just paying for water. The first wash bin is sort of dirty. That's where most of the resin gets washed off. And then the second one cleans off anything left from the first wash. Um, this two bin method works very well. I haven't had to replace any of the isopropyl and I have printed probably about 30 different things so far. And as for curing, I built a homemade Tupperware bin lined with aluminum tape and UV LED strips and a salvaged 12 volt power supply. And I always cure my prints underwater. 
And what this does is, I believe it stops oxygen from screwing with the curing process by essentially getting in the way of the oxygen because it's water. I find that this causes the print to cure much more evenly. Um, I don't end up with any of those weird sticky spots that sometimes happens whenever either it doesn't wash quite right or there's some isopropyl left and it messes with the cure. I'm not quite sure why that happens, but I've never had it happen whenever I cure it underwater, even just tap water. And of course, after they were cured, I rinsed them off again just in case and then made sure that they were nice and dry for the painting step. For painting, I initially tried a brush on metallic paint, but I found that it didn't look very nice, especially compared to this really nice metallic Rust-Oleum paint. Probably any metallic spray paint will do. I don't know what they put in this stuff, but it looks fantastic. I didn't use any primer because the surface of these resin 3D prints is already pretty rough just from the pixelation of the screen, but primer is always recommended, but I'm lazy. In addition to that, you can use a heat gun if you are extra impatient like I am. Just make sure that you don't use it too much, otherwise the 3D print tends to go a bit fruit stripes gum on you and gets a little bit floppy. And several thin coats as always are recommended, um, especially with the heat gun where you can just apply coat after coat in rapid succession. That's what I did here. I think I ended up doing like four coats. And now onto the casting. This is the most important step and probably where the most, I guess, development is in this. I don't know if anyone else has done this, but I haven't looked it up. So what I did is I used a low odor two part epoxy that has a long working time because putting all of the resin in in the right spot, getting it mixed up, it tends to take a while. And even with a 30 minute runtime, this took me about 40 minutes to actually cast it. However, it didn't firm up at 30 minutes because I diluted this resin with isopropyl alcohol. Just like isopropyl alcohol can dissolve resin from a 3D print, it can soften up or thin out the two part epoxy. Now, if you look this up, everyone who says how to thin epoxy use heat and if you use chemicals to thin it out like I did, you very, very seriously affect its structural properties because a lot of times two-part epoxies are used in structural applications like carbon fiber or fiberglass or epoxy tabletops. I originally tried it without diluting it and it was just impossible to send it through the syringe, but after it was cured, it was very hard, but the stuff that I diluted it was still a little bit soft, like I could bend it with my hands, the leftovers from the paint palette. But this is a pin badge, not a boat, so we don't need to worry about structural rigidity here. Although it will make it more prone to scratches, dings, and general wear. But you can actually make it. You may have heard the other thing I mentioned about syringes. Apparently you can just buy 24 gauge syringes off of Amazon. I obviously would not use them for their probably dubious intended purpose, but for putting resin exactly where you want it, works great. I mixed up usually about a 30 to 40 millimeter batch of resin for one batch of pins. I always had some left over, but you never want to run out midway through. Originally, I was using a paint palette and alcohol inks for dyeing it and mixing it up, although I found that the palette I was using just wasn't quite big enough for a batch of pins that was more than like two or three. Um, doing it in larger batches definitely makes it easier to make more. Um, so what I ended up using later, I still used the same cheap alcohol inks, which I also am using to dye clear 3D printed resin 3D prints. Um, I hopefully will give you a process video about that later. I have a really big print in the works, but I have just been extra busy, as you can probably tell by my recent upload schedule. But anyway, alcohol inks, cheap, 20 bucks, all the colors you could ever want, except for the ones that you want, which is opaque. You really should try to look for an opaque dye. I think a few powdered pigments would be more opaque, but this is Peter Brown territory, and I rarely work with resin. This is the first time I've actually worked with a two-part epoxy. But getting back on this tangent that we are three layers deep into, I used old, washed out, just barbecue sauce containers for my resin eventually, and 
That felt like a good low waste way to do things because these would normally get thrown out or recycled anyway, might as well give them a second or third use. As for general best practices when working with resin, you always want to make sure that you have a decent covering on your work area so that anything that resin gets on isn't something you care about. And that also goes for your hands. You don't want to get this stuff on your hands, it's very hard to wash off and very probably a skin irritant. With the whole situation right now, it's pretty hard to find decent gloves for a decent price, so I am using these cheap final gloves, which work okay. Silicone mats are generally the best for dealing with epoxy resins because it doesn't stick to it, but I also have this cutting mat underneath just to protect my lovely maple tabletop. But as for cleanup, um, I usually just disposed of these syringes because they were reasonably cheap, but after I did a few batches, I was just going through these things so quickly. And I actually, at the end of my last batch, attempted to clean them by just running some isopropyl through them and letting them sit in like an old used jelly jar. And it actually seems to have cleaned them up quite well. I can probably use them in future resin experiments. Obviously, you wouldn't want to use them in future medical experiments because resin is probably carcinogenic. This is generally when you do your color composition, so try to give some thought into which colors go with what. Complementary colors, what's next to each other. Things like that, that you can't really quantify until you're there and being like, eh, red, sure, that looks good. But after you're done casting, give them a good two days to cure. As I mentioned earlier, the solvent that is thinning out this resin increases its work time by a drastic amount. Um, which makes it easier to work with. You can probably work for it for at least an hour, whereas normally it would only be 30 minutes, but that also increases its cure time quite a bit. I think I only worked with these badges after a solid three days of curing, which, hey, whatever, it's an art project, it just sits there. At least you don't need to do anything. But after they're cured, there you go, you're done. Um, well, obviously these aren't pin badges yet, they're just things, but I modeled in a little key ring for mine so that I can slide a key ring through it so that I can make like a keychain stick on your backpack, stuff like that, which I honestly think is a little bit more useful than a pin badge. I don't actually have anything I could think of attaching a pin badge to, yet here I am making my own. But you can probably buy pin badge supplies from random online retailers or arts and craft stores and glue them onto the side. Maybe even 3D model in a feature that lets you locate that pin nicely and glue it in. Another thing I thought of that would be good for these fake pin badges would be fridge magnets. Get some cheap neodymium magnets, glue one on there, bam. Classy fridge magnet that's custom made. And that's about it. I hope you enjoyed this video and I hope you stay tuned for future ones. Thanks for watching.